faithful Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey to the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in the truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages. We believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe that he's calling his people to embody his story of grace. Bringing rescue and hope to the broken. May our lives be an offering of praise. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still begin this morning, would you give your attention to the baptistry for a baptism? What a uh, great morning to be gathered in the name of Jesus, uh, worshiping him, uh, loving him, and uh, being together as family. Uh, many of you know Megan Taylor. Um, she's been coming with Allison Brown for, uh, for a couple of years now. And ever since that I met Megan, she has been wanting to get baptized. Uh, she's been studying. She's been asking questions. She's been uh, waiting um, because she wants to give her life to Jesus. Uh, and this morning she comes uh, wanting to express her faith, to show everybody here that she loves Jesus Christ and that she believes that he is her Lord and Savior and that, that everything that the Bible says about him is true. Um, and so, Megan, this morning, I'm going to take your confession in front of everybody here, uh, a confession that I know uh, the answer to, uh, a question that I know the answer to, and that I know that you know. Um, Megan, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that he died for your sins to save you and to bring you back to God, uh, to give you a place uh, in his kingdom? Yes, sir. I know that you do. Um, and based on your confession, based on your belief, on uh, your love for Jesus, I'm going to baptize you here in this water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins um, and so that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. you will pray with me this morning. Father, we come to you this beautiful Sunday morning and in this joyous occasion. 
for Miss Taylor to be baptized and to be with you and to be with her family this morning. Father, we rejoice in all that you do for us, for each waking morning and for each sunset. Father, each day is a new one. And Father, I ask today that you help us live in that moment, not the future and not the past, but in that moment. I ask that you watch over us, lead us, guide us, help us to understand. And Father, most of all, put us in touch with you. Make us take the time to be with you to pray, to understand, just to meditate on what you are and who you are and who we are. Father, you give us life and you give us hope. Help us to open our minds this morning and pay attention to your words that you will feed this morning. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to Twickenham. I can tell you that the guys on the men's retreat are having a blast. And after spending Friday night in the bunkhouse, I can also uh, make the comment, I don't know how any of you women get sleep at all with your husbands. It, it was pretty incredible, but the, the camp has plenty enough wood to get them through the wind, you know, with all the sawing that was going on. Thank you for coming and being with us here at Twickenham. We would like a copy of, of your attendance here, and if you're a guest, you can fill out this side, or members, you can fill this. Or if you have your smartphones and you receive from Adrian a copy of the bulletin, you can just respond to that and we'll know that you were here. In Wednesday's Huntsville Times, uh, the headlines uh, for Dear Abby, I don't normally read it. Uh, it, it caught my eye. The woman who goes by the name Unhappy in Tampa shared that she and her husband recently ro uh, relocated to Florida and they've been there for a little over a year and they were quickly welcomed into the social scene of their neighborhood. And what they found out um, as a conservative couple, they were kind of taken back a little bit that two of the people in their dinner club practice an alternative lifestyle. Tampa writes this, while they are nice enough, my husband and I did not include them when it was our turn to host because we do not approve of their lifestyle choices. Since then, we have been excluded from neighborhood gatherings, and someone even suggested that we are bigots. I don't feel that we should have to compromise our values just to win the approval of our neighbors. Well, dear Abby's response was, you're upset because you're being excluded from activities and, and gatherings. It was the same treatment that you gave to this couple. She goes on to say that from where I sit, you may have chosen the wrong place to live because it appears you would be happier in a less integrated neighborhood surrounded by people who think the way that you do. But if you interact only with people like yourselves, you will have missed a chance for growth, which is what you have been offered here. Now, as I was reading this story, I was thinking this is symptomatic of where we are as a culture. You know, our Western society is deeply divided between those that, that follow Scripture and follow God's path and, and, and believe in, in moral decisions, and those that don't, that are more into self-discovery. And if, if you look and, and listen to what's going on in the news, it appears those are our only two choices. And the moral conformist says, well, the problem with today's world is immoral people. If they would only believe in truth and start following it, then our world would be a better place. Well, the advocates of self-discovery says, no, it's the bigoted people, those that say that we have a corner on the truth. What would help us more is if everyone had a more progressive and open mindset. That's the solution. And so both sides keep coming at each other, and, and they take their opinions to and, and hope the courts and politicians and the media and, some, and in some cultures in different countries, even the military, to back up their views. All the while, their group is getting further and further away from the outsiders. As we're going to see today, Jesus offers us another alternative to either one of these paths. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's stand and say hi to someone around us.
let the earth and heavens rejoice. For the Lord our God reigns. Every child of God lift your voice. For the Lord our God reigns. Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hope the souls redeemed to tell. For the Lord our God reigns. For the Lord our God reigns. Every thought we fill with his light. For the Lord our God reigns. All the hopeless dance with delight. For the Lord our God reigns. Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hope the souls redeemed to tell. For the Lord our God reigns. For the Lord our God reigns. Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free. Hope the souls redeemed to tell. For the Lord our God reigns. For the Lord our God reigns. For the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord our God reigns. You make beautiful things. All this pain, I wonder if I'll ever find my way. I wonder if my life could really change at all. All this earth, could all that is lost ever be found? Could a garden come up from this ground at all? You as we read from God's Word this morning. And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life.
You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Come ye weary, heavy laden, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Saints and angels, join in concert, sing the praises of the Lamb. While the blissful courts of heaven sweetly echo with His name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hear we now His love proclaim. Here we now his love proclaim. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here we now his love proclaim. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here we now his love proclaim. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, and we sing, Come, Lord Jesus, 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 come. stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out too deep, and we sing, come Lord Jesus, come Lord
devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so, so that we may proclaim the majesty of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, Eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told. He said freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know. I come to you to share his power as he told me to. He said freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you Others will know that I live. Go in my name. Brett and I were talking about this concept of outsiders. And it struck me, looking from the church perspective, as to how many things we may sometimes do that really alienates those who don't know us, who don't know our culture, who don't know our verbiage who don't know the things that we do and the things that we say and why. I remembered as a child, every Sunday when we would come to this part of the service, you got to watch as it went by, the bread and the juice. But man, don't touch it. I mean, you'd be out in a heartbeat if you touched it. And if I had a friend that we brought to church, did I just drop out? And I was on a roll too, come on. <laughs> Am I back or just, I'm back. If I had a friend that we brought to church at the same time that that would come by and they weren't from our church, I would say, no, you can't take that. Right? You're not allowed. Why? Because you're an outsider. Wow, isn't that interesting? Now, even more frustrating sometimes where there were those families that sometimes came to church that went ahead and let their small children take communion. And that was such a drag. Why do they get to do it when I don't? It's not fair. Well, you just don't understand. They're just different than us. Just not fair. Got a good family friend, friends of the family, a family that we're friends with. What am I trying to say? Several years ago that I was talking to about this because they allowed their kids to take communion. And I said, I said, I'm just curious why you've gone so against the norm, so against the regular. Why do you allow your kids to do that? And the mother said to me, she said, well, she said, do you remember Exodus 12? Well, not off the top of my head, but I'll check it out. Um, she said, Exodus 12 says this. 
Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. She said, you know, the Jewish children took part in the Passover meal for this very reason. And we just thought that it was a great way to teach our children to ask the questions about what, what we're doing and what it is and why it's important, and then we could answer. And I said, that's good. That's really, really good. As we come to communion, I remember that Paul said in Romans 10, anyone who believes in him, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I just wanted to say to you this morning, as we commune together, this is certainly for us, but it is for so much more than that. It is for people who don't look like us, people who don't think like us, people who don't act like us. And that doesn't matter. Jesus died for all. And because of that, don't you see, I believe that we have a burden to be more inclusive of people who aren't like us. And I just hope that you could think about that for a minute as that bread and that juice are passed again this morning. Let's pray together. God, we acknowledge you as the Almighty. We thank you for the sacrifice that we celebrate right now. And may it impress upon us how much you loved us. And may that impress upon us how much we need to love others. Thank you for the body of Jesus. As we take it now, we offer our thanks, and we say together in Jesus' name, amen. Tis midnight and dawn on its brow. The star is dim that lately shone. of free.
Tis midnight and from all removed The Savior wrestles lone with fears In that disciple We thank you for the grief and tears, the tears that have washed away our tears for ourselves and given us the joy of salvation. But God, I pray that as we share this juice together, we might be reduced to tears again for so many who don't know anything about this, to have a burden for those who don't know the good news that they might share the same joy and be included with us. Thank you for your blood shed on our behalf. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Tis midnight and for others give Spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this. 
to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Be seated. Thank you, Lincoln. What difficult times we live in. As I stated in our opening this morning, the gulf between those that recognize God and, and His Lordship and His teachings and His path and those that have kind of turned their, their back on that, it, it seems that gulf is getting wider, doesn't it? And, and it seems very difficult for us to figure out how to navigate these times when it, it seems like we hold less and less in, in common with our neighbors and co-workers and, and those that, that don't belong to the body of Christ. How do we connect with them? You know, a lot of people, when you're reading through the four Gospels, are amazed at Jesus' teachings. But others are, are very impressed by the, the miracles, and, and they're in, incredible. But the thing that's amazing, the things that, that impresses me most when I'm reading through the story about Jesus is how he encountered others and how he, he handled some very difficult situations, especially with those the Scripture calls the outsiders. Well, who were these outsiders that Jesus was interacting with? Well, for, for some, it was those that just didn't fit the mold. There was others that, for whatever reason, were not included within religious communities of the day. Sometimes it was the poor, sometimes it was the sick. Scripture also talks about the foreigner and some that were ostracized for their moral failures. But here's the cool thing. Jesus had a unique way of extending love, of offering forgiveness and providing community in a way that did not compromise the truth. And that's incredible. Why can't we do that? Because it, it seems today when you see people that stand up for truth in what's right, but what happens to them? Well, they get dogpiled and, 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 uh, and, and shunned and pounced upon and marginalized. And sometimes we just kind of feel like, well, within us and our households, we'll talk about what's truth. But out in the world, well, we're going to do our best to survive. And then we'll, we'll fellowship and surround ourselves with people that agree with us on truth. And, and sometimes... This is the easiest approach. And here's the thing. When, when I find myself doing that, there's something that's aching within my stomach. There's something that just doesn't quite settle right because I know somehow in these interactions that we're having out in the marketplace and out in the workforce and in schools, that these are opportunities to connect people with the gospel message. And I know Jesus wouldn't handle that the way we do. So sometimes I, I just wonder, how can we do things better? I don't think I'm alone in these feelings. Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal God, states this. Jesus' teaching consistently attracted the irreligious while offending the Bible-believing religious people of his day. However, in the main, our churches today have the opposite effect. And what he's saying is, is that churches are no longer uh, attracting the marginalized people of society. They no longer feel like that they have the clothes or, or the ability to, to come in and, and fit in within our congregations. So who are we attracting? We're attracting conservative people. We're attracting people that are buttoned down and moralistic and, and at least on the outside have it together and think and act like we do. If this is the case, the church is no longer serving as the church. How do we reverse this? How do we make the church and, and, and uh, brothers and sisters, how do we connect with people like Jesus did? How do we show them a heart of compassion and see with people that see the world and morality and truth in a very different way than we do? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading through Donald uh, Miller's blog. Maybe, maybe you've read uh, his book, Blue Like Jazz and some others. And I came across an interesting post in the the. The poster's really talking about the tendency that a lot of us have to control other people, to 
to try to get them to conform, try to get them to do what we like, and forcing others into our way of thinking. Well, Donald's friend kind of called him on this and, and helped him with the illustration that I think will help us as we're trying to appropriately figure out how do we connect with those people that we don't agree with. And I'm going to invite Maggie and Grant to come on up here. But basically in this post it said every relationship is like the cushions on a couch. And isn't this a fantastic couch? I grabbed it out of the, the teen wing. Nothing but the best for our youth group. All right. But basically he said that there's three cushions on the couch, and the first cushion represents our life. This is what we believe, and, and, and this is the, the life that we've kind of have, have put together. So that's our cushion. And then we've got a cushion with those that maybe think differently, and, and this is their life. This is how they're living, and it's the world they've kind of put together. And so for a lot of people, they say, okay, I'm going to stay over here on my cushion, and I'm going to keep as much space between me and you as, as possible. What he's saying is, if we're going to connect with people, there's also the center cushion. And this center cushion doesn't belong to either one. It represents the relationship between those on this cushion and that. And so if, if we look at this and what's happening, I'm responsible for the cushion I'm standing on. So you guys step on up there. But they're both responsible for the cushion in the middle. Together, they have this relationship, but at no point should it go beyond this to where one is coming over and making their way onto the other's cushion. Because that's when things get very awkward, and that is my daughter. <laughs> Just be careful. All right? But the basic idea is I can't change anybody. I can't force them, guilt them, or shame them into doing anything and we've all seen this in a lopsided relationship with, with maybe an overbearing parent or a boss or maybe the salesman that comes in and gets on your cushion. We want nothing to do with this. We want them to be in their space or at best in the common space. You guys move back. Ultimately, what we can do is we can talk, we can interact with one another, we can share ideas, but at the end of the day, your cushion is your cushion her cushion is her cushion, and we have to realize that. Let's give them a hand. Thank you guys for coming up. Just, you, you, you can leave me here. Just leave, leave me here. Be fine. All right, so, so think about that. We have our way of doing things, and there's people that, that disagree with that, but we are trying to build a relationship and find common ground in order for us to, to build on something and, and for us to, to get together. So I'm, I want us to see how this plays out in Scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. It's the fourth one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And it's a familiar story of the woman at the well. And I, I know that many of you guys have heard this over, but I, I hope that we can view this with, with kind of fresh eyes as we look at how Jesus kind of lived out this way of interacting with others. John chapter 4, and we're going to be beginning in verse and go through nine. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria named Sychar near the plot of the ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, you give me a drink? Well, his disciples had gone to the town to buy food, the Samaritan woman said, oh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Okay, for those that, that are kind of hearing this story for the first time, let me kind of bring you up to speed. You have the, the Jews that are, are traced down from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the way back, and they, they can trace their lineage. And then you've got the Samaritans. And the Samaritans originally were Jews, but they kind of started intermarrying in, uh, doing some inter intermarrying with the Gentile people after an occupation. So these are people that have kind of sold out. They're viewed as, as half-breeds and, and, and people that are second-class citizens. And so they want nothing to do with the Samaritans, and they avoid them. And for those of you that, that know this, just, just kind of humor me, but if you're up north in, in Galilee, you're making your way down, you've got to go through Samaria before you can get down to Jerusalem. And so you would 
instead of going straight down, you would cross over the Jordan River, go down a path, and you'd cross back over the Jordan, completely avoiding Samaria. Because you didn't want to be unclean. But that's not what Jesus does. So let's think about this with the cushions. So Jesus is over here. He says, normally I'm going to avoid that, but instead it says he had to go through. He had to connect. And so this woman comes in and says, what are you doing in this shared space? What are you even doing in, in, in our country? And why are you, a, a Jew, talking with me as a Samaritan? Why are you, a man, talking with me as a woman? This normally doesn't happen. This is odd. And Jesus says, I want to do this for a reason. It had less to do with geography and more to do with his mission. This is what's happening here. John 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, yeah, well, you, you have nothing to draw with. And, and, and the well where you're standing here, well, it's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well to drink from himself and did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? What Jesus is saying is culture dictates I shouldn't be here but there's a purpose. It's not my agenda. My agenda is for you to be connected with this living water, to find this, to bring you blessings. And her response is, be careful. Or, something's happening. You might want to step back. You might think you are something, but certainly you're not as important. Or are you assuming that, that you're greater than Jacob? Because I'm telling you, the life that I have here, there's nothing wrong with it. You Jews say that there is. But I'm staying over here. That's what he's saying. Jesus doesn't bite on the dispute. She's thinking if there's an interaction that's about to happen, it may be friendly now, but I know it's always going to end in an adversarial conflict. John 4 and verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, I, I want that. Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and having to keep coming back here to draw water. Once again, what he's saying to him is, the reason I'm here is for your benefit. I, I, I'm trying to, to tell you that there's a void in your life and I've got something that's going to help fill that. Something that, that's going to provide satisfaction for her. And so he's going to connect what's offered to her, this cup of cold water, with this void that he can fill if she'll only turn to her heavenly father. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband. Have him come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you have is not your husband. What you've said is, is quite true. You know, at, at this point in the story, he had her, didn't he? I mean, she's like, okay, I knew this was going to happen. At some point, it's get adversarial. And at this point, when he's standing here, he could have pulled out the double barrel shotgun and just started hitting her with chapter and verse. Let me tell you how your life is going wrong. This is not what God had intended. He, he could have. He had every right to. But he chose not to. Instead, he says, let's talk about what's going on in your life. Do you think that she needed to know that she had fallen short of the, the life that God had laid out? Does she need to be reminded of her immoral choices? No, she needed someone to care. Someone that would instead stop yelling from over there to, to this cushion, but come in the middle and say, I've got something new. I've got a new way of living. I've got a new way for you to check out because obviously what you're doing is not working. But she still can't trust. And she feels herself being kind of drawn into this. And it's uncomfortable. Because at this point, she becomes the one that's vulnerable. Up to this point, Jesus has been vulnerable. Coming to her, asking, and, and sitting down and asking for water from this woman. But this is the point where she becomes vulnerable. When it starts getting personal. And she says, we've got to back up here. So in verse 19, she says, sir... I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we worship is in Jerusalem. She's saying, your people, 
the, the, the people that, that you say that you represent, they're the ones that have caused this chasm. They're the ones that say, we can't come, and, and we've got to put distance there. And your hill in Jerusalem is somehow better than worshiping over here on our mountain. And I just got to remind you of that before we go any further in this conversation, that it's your people that have driven this wedge between us, that are causing my heart that was open to kind of close down. That's what she's saying. Jesus comes to her, and it says this discussion that we're having that's been carried on for generations, there's going to come a time when the things that we're arguing about aren't going to amount to a hill of beans. Verse 23, it says, Yeah, time is coming, has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father, the Spirit and truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and truth. The woman says, well, I've, I've heard that there's a Messiah coming. And, and when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Well, about this time, the disciples come in. And they've been from out of town gathering groceries. As they come up, what they notice is a, a Samaritan woman and a Jewish man are sitting here having their conversation. Both have a foot on this pillow. And as they're kind of figuring out this awkward situation as to what in the world is happening, we just, we just let him go for a few minutes and look what he's gotten into. We're going to have to somehow rectify this situation. But because he did and risked coming and, and making this conversation and, and carrying this on, the woman steps back and she says, I've got to go into my village. She goes and, and tells the people, you're not going to believe who I just talked with. A Jewish man came into our country and started talking with me about the things going on in my life. He's extending a relationship and talking to me about what's happening. The people are blown away that a Jewish man would do this. Could this be the rabbi? Here's what happens in John chapter 4 and verse 30. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Ten verses later in, in verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed with them two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. See the power that happens? We humble ourselves. We make ourselves vulnerable. Where we have conversations and build relationships with people, the world says uh, uh, there, there shouldn't be any interaction with at all. There's power there. And people in the other cushion recognize that. You know, there's no doubt in our culture that it's rapidly changing. And, and it scares us, doesn't it? You know, some of the things we read about and some of the, things, the stories that we hear. And we long for our childhood when, when things were simpler. And we wish for our children and our grandchildren that they didn't have to live in, in a world that's so difficult. But when we're having conversations about what's happening out of society, which cushion do we talk about? What, what's the focus? Is it not this one? Is this not what we are consumed with? What does Jesus say? Jesus encourages us to look at the other two cushions. And that's what we see in Scripture. The first one we need to look at is over here. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get serious as a church about the sin in our lives. We do. And I know that sounds harsh. I know it sounds uncaring. If we have any hope of being salt and light in the community, people have got to look at what we're doing and saying we're serious about what we say is important. There's got to be a difference. We, we can't call people to some... And, and basically, I'm living the same life as the guy I'm calling... Well, then what am I supposed to do? We don't have to make a whole lot of changes. Just come to church more often. Is that, is that really what we're calling people to do? Or are we not coming and saying, this is a community where addicts find help. This is where a community where I was brought back with my wife and we were heading to the courthouse to sign the papers. This is a community where you can find hope where there's transformation, where there's hope, where there's grace that's offered. But if people can't see that, they're not going to see Jesus. 
You know, a lot of us love the 2009 movie, The Blind Side. How many of you like The Blind Side? Isn't it great? You know, it's about a woman that opens up her heart, opens up her family to a, a teenage a boy on the street and, and invites him in and kind of fosters his love of, of football. Well, Sandra Bullock is hysterical, and she played Leanne Tooley, the woman who eventually adopted Michael Orr and changed and set in course a, a, a series of activities to where he finished high school, went on to college, and now plays in the pros for the Baltimore Ravens. But Sandra Bullock earned her first Academy Award with this role. But what a lot of people don't know is Sandra Bullock turned down this role three times before she eventually accepted this part. In an, an article, she was talking about this movie, and she said she loved the script, but she didn't know if she could play the part of a devoted Christian mother. And here's why. She said, one of my biggest concerns stepping into this was how people use their faith and their religion as a banner. And then they don't do the right thing. They go, well, I, I'm a good Christian. I go to church, and this is the way you should live your life. And I'm like, don't give me a lecture on how to live my life. You go to church every week, but I know you're still sleeping around on your wife. You've got to get serious about sin. You know, in a last-ditch effort, writer and director John Lee Hancock convinced her, just go to Memphis. Start shadowing the Thule family and, and go to, to Briarcrest Christian School. So Bullock, as a favor to him, decided to go, journey to Memphis. And she was blown away. Here's what she said. She said, I told Leanne I don't buy a lot of people who use their faith as a shield. But she was so open and honest and forthright. And I thought, wow, I finally met someone who practices but doesn't preach. Someone who blazes trails and they do it together as a family. At the end of the interview, when she was most vulnerable, the actress said this, I now have the blessing of having my faith risk. And then she stopped herself. Not a restored faith, but now I have a faith in those that say they represent a faith. I finally met people that walk the walk. You know, I, I get a little sad sometimes when I hear people kind of play the whole Christians are hypocrites as an excuse for, uh, for not considering the Christian faith. Because I, I just don't think it's fair. But with that said, do we not have to do everything possible to make sure that this is an attractive lifestyle that we're calling people to a lifestyle that truly makes a difference what does paul say he's writing to the church at corinth he says hey when i told you in the past not to hang out with people that are living simple lifestyles he says i wasn't talking about this cushion I, I wasn't talking with people outside the church what i meant was you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slander, a drunkard or a swindler. With well, such a man, don't even eat. What business is mine to judge those outside the church? But are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Leave them to them, but expel the wicked man from among you. We have to any influence in the world. We've got to get serious about our faith. We've got to realize our calling, and I, I'm not calling us to be perfect. We've got to be striving by the grace of God to become more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be His witnesses in the world. Amen? Sandra Bullock was so moved by her encounter with Leanne Tooley that she had her own blindside moment when she adopted her son, Lewis. So there's someone that's over here looking at this saying, I want what you have. I want to open up my heart to this. The second we need to, thing we need to focus on is the middle cushion. I believe like Jesus, we've got to be the ones that are taking the initiative, that are going, that are trying to build relationships, trying to connect with people. I love the story of Jonathan Falwell, who tells the story about his famous father, the preacher Jerry Falwell. Years ago, Jonathan traveled with his father out to Florida to attend a debate between Jerry Falwell and Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler magazine. Well, th they had a good, healthy discussion. And after it was over, uh, Larry Flint came up to Jerry Falwell and said, do you mind giving me a ride home on your private plane? And Jerry said, absolutely, come on. 
So he and his son and Mr. Flint drove to the airport and all boarded a Falwell's Gulf Stream. And there they are up in the air. And Jonathan said he watched, sitting across the aisle, watching his dad talking with Mr. Flint, talking about politics and sports and food and events of the day and telling stories back and forth. He said it looked like they were old friends. He said it was just incredible. And he's watching this like they're lifelong buddies. And when they got off the plane and in, in Lynchburg, Virginia, and, and Mr. Flint went his way, he asked his dad, he said, Dad, how can you do that? How can you carry on a conversation with Larry Flint as if you guys have been friends all of your life? He said, Dad, he's the exact opposite of everything you believe in. He's doing and living out and promoting everything that you preach against. And yet, I I listen to you guys, and and you're treating him as if he were a member of our church. Why? Because Dad's response totally changed Jonathan's view of the world and his role as a minister, instead in the gospel. He said, Jonathan, there's going to be a day when Larry Flint is hurting and lonely. He's going to reach out for someone for help and guidance. He's going to pick up the phone and call someone. I want to earn the right to be that phone call. I got to thinking, who am I reaching out to? Who am I earning the right to be that phone call when God opens up their heart to that? That's our invitation for us today. To think about this, it it begins with this cushion over here. And just like Megan, maybe you've been studying and, and, and you've been reading You've been spending time with other believers and you're thinking about that. Maybe today is the day that you say, I want this to be my life. I want to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. I promise everyone in here would love to stick around after services for another baptism today. Uh, Perhaps you've started your walk with God, but you've got some stuff going on. Maybe taking a step back a little bit. You've got some unconfessed sin. And you think it's not really bothering you and it's just hurting it's not hurting anyone else but what it does is it keeps us from extending the gospel message we don't want to be this hypocrite and we can't really call someone to a lifestyle that we're not leaving so it paralyzes us let's deal with that today we've got brothers and sisters that would love to pray with you if you'd like to come forward and and share some of that today or our shepherds will be involved or after services would love to, to get involved in that conversation and spend time with you Maybe that's not you. Maybe you're ready for this. You're like, I'm ready for this second conversation. I, I want to be able to, to step out onto this cushion and to start building relationships with people that I haven't talked with in a long time, that I, I, I quite frankly don't know what, what to say to them. Why don't you start the conversation like Jesus did, offering love, talking about God's forgiveness, extending community, and just leaving it up to God? But sometimes when we do this, we're like, we're not seeing any tangible change. What does Scripture say? Well, sometimes we're casting seeds. Other times we're watering the seeds that others have casted. But we leave it up to God, and in God's time, He restores people. I want to encourage us all to be a part of God's reconciliation. Pulling, You've been pulled back into God's family. Let's join in that. Let's offer that cup of cool water. Let's provide this community. Let's offer this fellowship to others. Let's join in this message of reconciliation. You can respond to the gospel today. We invite you as we stand as we sing. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see
of Christ. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see. seated please great morning and I don't I don't know if you could see it but there were tears after the baptism that's awesome good stuff thanks for being here this morning great morning Um, as we close as always just a few things uh, of shopkeeping here first of all um, Many of you are friends with David Blankenship, uh, the Blankenship family's members at Mayfair. His mother, Nolene Blankenship, passed away. And that funeral is, um, oh, Brenda, today or tomorrow? Tomorrow um, at Mayfair. The visitation is from 1 to 2.30 at Mayfair, and then the funeral is at 2.30 at Mayfair. So many of you will want to know about that. Um, Also, Joe Thomas had hip replacement surgery, and uh, Kathy said he's really had a struggle with it. Uh, He has been moved to Redstone for rehab and and hopefully be getting better, but please keep uh, Joe in your prayers as well. Also this morning, volunteers. We have a great need for volunteers in our children's ministry. Filling the holes each week is sometimes difficult. If you would be willing to serve in the children's ministry as a nursery or preschool helper, please contact Amy Smith. Just call the church office and let us know because we really need the help. Starting point class. Starting point class is a two-week class that allows those placing membership with Twickenham to learn more about this church. It also helps us to understand individual interests and assimilate people into the body here. The next starting point class is March the 2nd and also on March the 9th. During class time, you can see or email Steve Krigger to sign up for more information or just give us a call again at the office. For the last several weeks, we have highlighted some of the faces of kids from the Hacienda of Hope. And that's because there's a big date coming up on March the 2nd. And what is that? Say it out loud. Okay, special contribution next Sunday. (laughs) It's too hard? Oh, sorry. I'll be more specific. Next Sunday, we're having a special contribution. And uh, just again, a reminder about that. Here's a one little short clip uh, to keep in your minds this week. You've had a chance to see and hear from some of our children during the last few weeks. Today, we want to give you a brief peek at some of the wonderful moments in their lives over the last few months. We've told you about the karate lessons. As impressed as you might be with their form, take a look at the satisfaction on their faces. and look at the sense of accomplishment as they receive their yellow belts. A recent trip to the hair salon was just enough to put a massive smile on our girls' faces. This was the very first time for some of our girls to even enter a beauty salon. Cynthia's expression says it all. She had no idea how beautiful she really is. Of course, we all hope for a spiritual makeover. 
This transformation was seen last week as Maria and Maria Beatrice proclaimed their faith in Jesus through baptism. When we see these pictures, can we possibly doubt that God is in control? So remember, the next time you should visit the Hacienda, Hacienda not to mess with the kids, because they will karate you upside the head. <laughs> Good stuff. Remember next week, Big Sunday, our special contribution for the Hacienda. Thanks for being here this morning. Let's stand, and we'll close in prayer. We hope you have a great day today. Holy Father, we lift you up as the true and living God, and we commit our lives to you in all ways. Father, thank you for reaching out to us as, as outcasts and, and sinners and, and those who are just completely in need. And Father, as an extension of, of your love and your, your uh, outreach to us, may we reach out to those around us. May we understand that You've created us each special, each unique and as individuals, but that you also created us to, to be one in your name. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to break down those walls, those barriers, and to, uh, to reflect you and all those that we come in contact with. God, thank you for your, your son, Jesus. Lead us through this week. May we, uh, may we reflect your glory in all things. In his name, amen.